together. It's a really beautiful thing when we see the body of Christ gather in scenarios like this and we worship and pray together in fellowship. There is healing in the name of Jesus as we gather in his name. And this morning, we want to uh, continue a series we've begun about gathering. We have gather, grow, give, and go as part of the vision forward, but we're in the Gospel of Matthew right now, and Ricky talked last week uh, uh, out of the passage of Matthew 5 through 7, particularly about chapter 7. And so today, we want to go into Matthew chapter 8. If you have your Bible, I'll invite you to turn there and if you're online this morning, I would invite you to join us too and uh, with your uh, device. Now, as you're turning there, it's a, a really powerful thing to hear the testimonies from the experience of last week. If you were here last week, you know we did one worship service where all the uh, congregations, communities were together, and then we had this fantastic time of worship and testimony, and, and then we had lunch together. And so a a friend was telling me this week that when he went to work Monday, uh, (coughs) his coworker said, so what'd you do yesterday? He goes, oh, I I had lunch with uh, a group of friends from India, Kenya, Mexico, Colombia, and the U.S. And they said, well, what, were you out of the country? Were you at an international gathering? He goes, no. That happened at my church. When we gather together as people from all walks of life, not just geographically, but generationally, uh, even varied interest, the presence of God is so real and at work, and God is in ministry to all people and all means all. And so the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ then becomes our testimony of what it's like to be in this fellowship where we live in this expectant faith where God is moving. And so that leads us to Matthew chapter 8. When we look at Jesus and his teaching on the Mount of Beatitudes, there on the north shore of Galilee, we are just transfixed on the clarity of all the wonderful things he talked about. The people were mesmerized. I mean, read chapter 5, read chapter 6, read chapter 7. It's his longest discourse and is so beautiful that he is not just teaching to amaze them, he is teaching to train them. For what? To live out what he's teaching and live out the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so there comes a time, though, where it's time to dismiss the crowd, and there in that area you have Tabka, Capernaum, And they go back down the hillside and down into the valleys of life, if you will, to be fully present with who? With regular people like you and me in our community. Hurting people. People who need hope. People who need encouragement. People who need healing. People who need help people who have been uh, ostracized, people who are insecure, people who are living in fear. In other words, the word of God becomes practicum in their lives. Best example I can give you guys is that's precisely what happened in Guatemala. The word of God was incarnate and in your gathering and in your ministry there, the Lord used you greatly in your witness for Christ. For some of you who are teachers, that's exactly what's happening in your classroom. You're doing far more than just teaching an academic subject and uh, affirming and growing the whole child. You have your Christian witness. 
For many of us, this occurs in the workplace. So it was a brilliant move by Jesus to say, all right, now let's go down the mountain and let's go to Tabca, to Capernaum, to these places, Gadrenes, and let's live into the real power of the gospel. So as we look at Matthew chapter 8 and verse 1, I want to remind you of this. We gather not only for corporate worship, but we gather in prayer groups and small groups. We gather in twos or threes. Wherever we gather in the name of Jesus, we need to gather with the expectant faith that miraculous and contagious works of God will occur. Miraculous and contagious works of God will occur. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at this passage, and there's going to be three occasions of healing. Look at those. And then at the close of our service today, we're going to offer you a time to receive prayer and to receive the move of God, presence of God, at whatever point of need you may have. So here we go. When Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. That would be expected. But immediately a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Now, I don't know how to liken what it's like to have leprosy in our day, but let me tell you about what the Levitical law required. If you were diagnosed with leprosy, you were not just deemed physically sick, you were deemed socially unacceptable. You were put outside the gates. You were cast outside the community. It didn't matter if you had family or friends or whatever. If you had leprosy, you were castigated to a place of isolation. And the only way you could ever be restored to the community was to show yourself to the high priest that somehow the leprosy had gone. In this case, leprosy is kind of a simile, a a metaphor, an analogy, however you want to frame it, of the nature of sin and its only cure being the miracle of God in Jesus Christ giving his life for us. So anyway, when the lepers were diagnosed or observed, they had to identify themselves as being unclean when they were around other people. So like if, if you happened to come around me, I'd have to say, I'm a leper. I'm a leper. In other words, you'd have to declare, I'm somebody you don't want to be around. Can you imagine the kind of emotional, physical, intellectual healing it would require to move beyond that? If you're willing, he said to Jesus, you can make me clean. (laughs) Jesus did the unthinkable. He reached out and he touched the man. He touched the leper. He touched the leprosy, and he said these words, I am willing. I am willing. Say that with me. I am willing. Understand that God, when we gather in Jesus' name, invites us to live in expectant faith because God's heart is, yes, I am willing. I am willing. And so he just spoke the word. After he touched him, he spoke the word. He said, be clean, and immediately he was cleansed. So here's the first healing, that as soon as they came down, they went to where people were gathering, and when they went to where people were gathering, they saw the practicum of what Jesus had taught about as they began to see people healed, delivered, 
and set free from sickness and death by faith in Christ. It was a healing with a purpose. And the purpose was to give glory to God, to build the kingdom of God, and to declare the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it was for all people, all means all. All people. And so we move to a little further in chapter 8, and we see a different kind of gathering. So after he had finished with the healing with the person who had leprosy, and they were restored, they were not only healed, by the way, they were restored to their family, they were restored to their community, they were intellectually restored, they were emotionally restored, the mistake, the sickness, the isolation, whatever it is that people experience, Jesus has a capacity to overcome that and restore us to a place of love and wholeness with him and with the community. That's the purpose of this body of Christ, to be a redeeming, restoring group. So he moves from there and he enters Capernaum. Now, if you've ever been there, you realize that the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum is probably less than a half a mile of the Mount of Beatitudes. And in Capernaum, there was a temple that was third century BC that Jesus would have gone to and taught in and whatnot. And not 50 yards from that temple, we know is Peter's house because it's been excavated and archaeologists have told us that there are inscriptions there and of course it's been made a wonderful place of gathering and a holy place. My point is we're talking about a community maybe from Newtown Park to here. It's not all that big geographically and so it's important for us to remember there would be a high likelihood that Not only this person who once had leprosy would be known to many people in that community, but so would this centurion, and so would Peter. Look at verse 5. So when he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him and asked for help. What had Jesus already said? I am willing. He came to him and he said, Lord, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. This is him interceding for his servant. This is the first time we see the intercessory role that we're called to, that Jesus has trained us in, that it's not just we're rushing to ask prayer for ourselves. This is a man who is in charge of over 100 soldiers, who's obviously a well-respected community leader. Though he's Roman and he's Gentile, the fact of the matter is, He is interceding with love and care at the feet of Jesus for someone else. (laughs) And Jesus said to him, shall I come to your house and heal him? Well, anybody that knew a Levitical code and understood what a rabbi's place would be would understand that for Jesus as uh, a Jew uh, in his priestly role to enter a Gentile's home would make him what? Unclean, yeah. You see how he's laying aside, aside barriers to proclaim that the good news of the gospel is for all people? It's so powerful. And so Jesus shows an eagerness In this case, before he's ever asked, the guy's just saying, I got a guy that works with me that I love that I'd like to intercede for. He's uh, been injured apparently and is paralyzed and is in the bed. He doesn't ask for healing. Jesus eagerly reveals the heart of God and says, do you want me to come to your home and heal him? That's pretty willing, isn't it? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. 
Yes, Lord, that's what we would say. I mean, absolutely, absolutely. But the centurion said, hey, Lord, this is so humbling. I don't deserve you to have to come under my roof. Wow. Maybe he really felt undeserving. Maybe he was aware of the Levitical law. But listen to this faith. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. Wow. Wow. And so let's make sure we pay attention to the fact that when Jesus was going to where people were gathered, and people were being gathered with others to Jesus, that there was this contagious move of God of intercession where people like you and I advocate and believe that God is able to heal the people we're bringing into the presence of Jesus. I won't get into the guys who lowered their friend down, paralyzed friend, you know, in a mat into the presence of Jesus. That's another gospel story for another day. And so what is our call? Our call is not just to sit on the mountain and say, man, that's some awesome teaching or that's some incredible worship or I'm really pumped up now, you know. It's to receive the grace of God in those scenarios but then to transmit that grace as a conduit and to serve and to receive and proclaim and share and live in intercession by the grace of God. So you and I are called to this. It's why we gather with expectant faith. So Jesus just said, man, you got great faith. He turned to his disciples. He said, I haven't seen faith like this. This time he didn't touch the guy. He didn't even go there. He just spoke the word, let it be done as you've believed, and his servant was healed. Wow. They move from there right across the road, so to speak, and look at verse 14. In verse 14, they come to Peter's house. He sees Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever, and he this time he touches her, and the fever leaves her, and then she gets up, and she begins to serve and live in hospitality. And then after that, word had gotten out, so the People in Capernaum, in Tabca, in northern Galilee, all the way to Gadranese, began to bring the sick and the demon-possessed. You see that word? And Jesus drove out those spirits. What does that mean? That means that there were people who were living in bondage because of spiritual forces that were at work in them, that had them in bondage, were destructive to their families and themselves and were destructive to the body of Christ. Jesus had no fear of that and he came to set the captives free. This is the solution or the image to this. And then finally, the gospel writer Matthew notes this was to fulfill what was written almost a 1,000 years before in Isaiah 54 about the prophecy of the Messiah, Jesus. He took up all of our infirmities and bore all our diseases. And if you see Isaiah 53 quoted again in the book of Peter, you know it also says, and by his stripes we are healed. And so we've got this incredible thing all unfolding here in chapter 8 and people are gathering with Jesus and others and they're being physically healed and spiritually healed and emotionally healed of damaged emotions and of of, of, of different types of victimization. They're experiencing spiritual deliverance. And so the power of people gathering in the name of Jesus and Jesus going to where people are gathering has one common element. 
And that is Jesus is willing, God is willing, and when he finds people who are willing to receive him on his terms, you can live in the expectant faith of great and glorious and contagious things happening in the family of God. This is why we gather. This is why we're about to pray. Now, I don't normally give homework, but Matthew's eight so good. Listen, this week, I want you to read it, but pay attention because there's more. Like in verse 23, uh, Jesus is in the boat asleep, a storm comes up, wind and waves are crashing over the boat, and there's not a physical healing or an emotional healing or anything like that, but there is this. Listen, this is very important. The disciples are freaked out, and they're saying, man, we're suffering from lack of sleep here, We're terrified over these circumstances. Just think about how that applies. How many of you are losing sleep over work or school, children or parents, circumstances? You understand? The whole mindset of, oh my gosh, circumstances have really just got me frazzled and broken. Jesus speaks to the wind and the waves And they cease. And so there is yet another powerful image of when we gather to bring our circumstances to Jesus. That he can intervene through the power of the Holy Spirit. Does he always change them or solve them? No, sometimes he just gives grace sufficient for dealing with them in the moment. But the point is, is that he is with us. So our worship band is gonna come back and our prayer partners are getting ready to uh, be here at the front. And I just wanna put you at ease because we've got, you know, a few minutes. And I want you to understand that this was not a historical passage to indicate a historical incident or a historical dynamic only. This is the kingdom of God at work where people gather. And we need to live in the expectation that when we gather together in worship, when we gather together in small group, when we gather together on the mission field or like we did uh, Sunday afternoon at Sunday supper, it was amazing to see our team, both English speaking and Spanish speaking, rush to people who were coming to receive food and pray with them that they would literally run to them before they got to us. And they prayed incredible prayers over people that have unspeakable circumstances, including one family who appeared to have everything their own in a collection of bags and a wagon. You see, there's healing and help when we gather for worship and teaching and training, not not that we would just grow spiritually, but that we would be willing and reflective of God's willingness to do great miraculous things.